Hello and welcome to Road Atlanta in Brazelton, Georgia, home of the Round of Georgia, the fourth of 25 races in this year's TM Master Cup Series Tour, the first road course of the season after a series of short tracks opened the calendar. This winding and twisting circuit was built in just over six months back in 1969 and it opened in 1970. Ever since then it has been one of the premier road racing facilities in all of North America, hosting just about every category of road racing imaginable, yes, including cycling. However, when cycling here, uh, the cyclists will ride this track backwards because the, of the uh, dangerous grade of the S's that you see in the background. At least that would be dangerous for cyclists more so than for uh, racing cars for very obvious reasons. Now let's meet the 42 cars that will start the round of Georgia. On the pole, Joe Olenek in car number 23 for Hot as Walter Racing and Marco Diaz Castaneda, one of the stars in qualifying this year. Cameron Taylor and Kurt Pliskin in row 2. The two Lynx drivers in row three, Ingrid Hadeland, and a great effort from Liv Eklund, who is improving rapidly. Adrian Devereaux and David Krikorian both have had success here in the past. Uh, Alessandro Rossini and Scott Bates as well. Arto Kakinen and Tony Durbin are both looking to improve on their efforts from last season. Tony Durbin, of course, was here as a promoter's option last year. Saul Fischel, the Carbondale winner in row seven, surprising given his road racing pedigree, and Zelda Ashby. Greg Woodard and promoter's option Keegan Mallory from the DH Racing team from Knoxville. Tom Moore and Gaspar D'Souza in row nine. Great effort from D'Souza there. Craig Yancer continuing to impress in row 10, and Ike Durbin a big improvement from the Team Timothy car. Ian Cooper heads up row 11, and Brandon LaRoe flanks them. Woody Watts the second promoter's option, and Timothy Ruiz, who's having a great season so far. Chuck Johnson and John Dilks in row 13. Mason Yokoyama, independent trophy contender, and Yevgeny Kuznetsov in row 14. Great effort from Daniel Lechleiter to qualify 29th, and Luciano Savarol. What's he doing back there in, in 30th on the grid? Big, uh, big disappointment from the Brazilian. Lawrence Gravity Racing has row 16 locked out, but what's a surprise is that Grabert was quicker than Carroll. Freya Mast and Nathan Ormond in row 17. Good efforts from the Independence Trophy contenders. Zach Webster and Truman Ellison in row number 18. Row 19, Casey Lester and Gareth Hunt. Row 20, Dylan Buchanan making his Master Cup debut, replacing the suspended Clay Gibson and Ben Atkins, whose time was disallowed after qualifying. The same can be said for Ryan Matthews and Chris Davenport, and we'll get into why in just a little bit. Anyways, the grid field is on the grid right now. Joe Olenek in the blue car on driver's left. And on the right side of the track is Marco Diaz Castaneda. The lights are out, and away we go. Olenek, bit of a slow start there. What a start by Castaneda in car number nine. Castaneda getting away, and here comes Cameron Taylor on the inside in car number seven. Uh, uh, everyone looks like they've gotten away cleanly so far. No one stalled in the back. Pliskin in that black and gold 16. As we now enter the S's, Castaneda beginning to pull away a little bit. Oh, Lennox slides on cold tires. Hadeland using him for a reference, also slid with him, looks like. Cameron Taylor going for second in the Schaefer Group car number seven. Olenek racing him fairly cleanly here. Ca Cameron Taylor, what a move for the Ohio and around the outside to take over second place uh, on the opening lap. Bliskin has uh, fallen into fourth, or fallen in line into fourth, and we've had somebody off in the back, I think, but it looks like they've rejoined. Here's Ben Atkins in car number 90. The two Matthews Motorsports cars, cars 90 and 06, were uh, found to be too low after qualifying, but in their case, it was due to a shock mount failure, so that might actually have saved their case in that instance. Uh, they will not be penalized any further. Chris Davenport in that 17 car, though, no case of a part failure, as Gareth Hunt has gone off in the back. In the background of the previous shot, the 42 car went off the road. Hunt rejoined. And they're running currently in last. Here is Ingrid Hadeland in car number 19. That's Adrian Devereaux in the 74 right there. Uh, Devereaux trying to set up Hadeland here. Devereaux making a move for it. Going downhill in the last corner. That's a gutsy move. Here comes Devereaux. First lap, by the way. Adrian Devereaux taking over uh, the position. Here comes Eklund right through. Liv Eklund, Ingrid Hadeland's teammate. That's going to get Ingrid's attention to see uh, that 11 car go by. That 74 car, Adrian Devereaux. Very easy car to spot. A very patriotic uh, uh, paint job on that 74 car. As Hadeland might have gotten into Eklund. Eklund slides that car wide just a little bit, but she keeps it on the road. Very intense rivalry between the two uh, Lynx racing drivers um, on track and uh, a little bit off track as well. But that team, uh, they're working very well together, it looks like, in the paddock, which is very interesting to see. As Castaneda trying to pull away a little bit, but Cameron Taylor trying to run him down. Earlier in the week, Marco Castaneda said that uh, he wasn't that much of a road racer and, was, and has been pleasantly surprised by his qualifying performances uh, uh, this year and this week. 
Uh, that backs up a, a lot of his TM Light success. He only has one win on a road course. All of his other TM Light wins uh, have come on ovals. He is one of the better uh, oval drivers among some of the younger prospects coming up through the ranks. And uh, uh, his oval driving is why, uh, and his oval setup skill in particular, is why he was as competitive as he was in the Junior League categories and in the Mexico Series. Here is the car number four, Tom Moore, another one of the great short trackers that's made his way into the Master Cup Series. Uh, Moore a little bit wide there along with Zelda Ashby. Uh, the, uh, the word in the paddock is that Tom Moore and Marco Castaneda are probably the two best short track drivers among some of the younger guys. I know it's a little weird to say that Tom Moore is one of the younger guys when he's been around as long as he has, but it really doesn't feel like that considering that this is his first shot in a competitive car. Here is Cameron Taylor, uh, one of Tom Moore's former teammates running up in second. Cameron Taylor, one of the better road racers to come up. Whoa! Off goes Castaneda, but he rejoins. Cameron Taylor, one of the better road racers to uh, find, find his way into a decent car after spending uh, some, after wasting his time rather with the uh, a rather awful old Star Factory team. And here is Kurt Pliskin in car number 16. Stole a good result last year. And uh, this car took a very long time to clear tech, I should point out. Uh, the 16 car was uh, the only one of the PSI cars that had any issues passing tech at all. He did, so the car was legal. It may have taken a while, but uh, oh, there's Dylan Buchanan with a little bit of a slide. Buchanan's had a long weekend. It's a debut weekend for him, but looks like he minimized that error, and uh, that's good to see for uh, uh, Buchanan, the Scott, uh, having a bit of a rough introduction to the series so far. Tom Moore back up to uh, 16th. That's Craig Yonser in that 81 car right behind him. And then Ian Cooper in the uh, yellow uh, and black car number two. Tom Moore uh, trying to avoid falling back through the field a little bit further. The, but uh, uh, he has been uh, reported to, uh, to be getting on quite well with Leonid Roderick on the booth calling the strategy for that team. We, were a little, we, we weren't sure how those two were going to get along, but it looks like their seeming op uh, opposite personalities have gone on pretty well as Cooper makes a dive. That's three wide, into Yonser, into Moore, and around goes the four. Uh, that was a little unnecessary as Cooper stuck their nose in there. And uh, that was a very, very late send there. And uh, that's not going to make anyone at Volpe very happy because uh, that is a lot of damage to the right side of the four car. That's a lot of suspension damage that's going to put them out. But, yeah, Cooper's not going to be earning too many friends with their anti- Oh, wide! Uh, well, oh, and almost cutting off Keegan Mallory in the 78. Now, I almost wonder now, there's issues with the brakes on that car, as Woody Watts bails for the pits in the 61. Uh, that's who that car is in the background, as Mallory, the Irishman, uh, is running this race as a promoter's option, but uh, since the Independence Trophy is a best of four uh, races regardless, uh, this will count for Independence Trophy points for the DH Racing team, who's based not too far from here. Here is Yevgeny Kuznetsov in the 15 car in contact with Tim Ruiz, and off he goes, and there's Yokoyama in the background as well in the 76. Bit of a surprise to see uh, Kuznetsov this far down the field. Uh, Tony Durbin has been leaning on him quite heavily for setup information on road courses, so it's really a surprise to see uh, Kuznetsov being uh, beaten by uh, his much older teammate. Uh, here is Saul Fischel, the Carbondale winner. Now, he is, uh, now his abilities on the road courses are why he uh, locked up the TM Lights Championship um, when he did last year, uh, Saul Fischel, uh, it's a little bit of a surprise to see him back only in 10th place, and I know say back only in 10th because 10th is still a good result, but, um, regardless, he hasn't faced any, uh, criticism from any, uh, major news outlets for his antics at Carbondale, and despite Liv Eklund getting a penalty for that, Fischel, uh, had the baffling claim that he was outraged at that, and that, uh, she, uh, that Eklund should be suspended for that. I'm not sure if uh, Liv Eklund being yelling at warrants her being suspended, but all right. Uh, he ec he echoed those sentiments on Steve Pater's show, and um, I haven't seen two clowns that close to each other since the last time I was at the circus. Uh, needless to say, Eklund and Hadeland, er, Eklund, Hadeland and Lynx Racing were not particularly amused, and if you don't know how I feel about it, then I don't know what to tell you. Alessandro Rossini in eighth right now. Now, you want to talk about good road racers in, T in the TM Master Cup Series, that conversation has to include Rossini because uh, Alessandro Rossini, as if uh, Alessandro Rossini pushed Leonid Roderick very hard when they were teammates, it was a very respectful rivalry over there as Hadeland slides it wide, but uh, they always managed to keep improving each other over there at Volpe, and Rossini continuing to uh, kind of show the way for Volpe uh, on road courses, at least so far this year. 
Uh, this, granted, Tom Moore being out of the race uh, kind of helps that argument. But regardless, he has been very competitive on road courses in the past. And with the European Tour coming up, watch out for this car. White and orange, car number three. Uh, he has been doing very well uh, on uh, in the European Tour the past few years. Uh, we're looking back now at Zach Webster. We're looking for him. There he is. Uh, Gaspar D'Souza on the 20 car, by the way, is Reese has been off the track, I do believe, in that 20 car. That's why he's as far down as he is. Now, I'm a little now uh, most of us, I think, are a little surprised Webster is running down in the 30s, and while Craig Yonser is running in contention for points, I think most people at the start of the year would have projected the exact opposite to be happening. Yonser has beaten Webster four times in four races in qualifying, and I think some questions are now being asked if Zach Webster can pick up the pace a little bit. That's a bit disappointing for Webster. Here's Freya Mass, the Texan, in the 898 car in 29th place. She's been having a pretty good uh, start to the race. There's Ike Durbin in the 711 car, and Ben Atkins as well, showing up. Durbin making a move for it. Ike slides in, squeezing Mass a bit. Mass sliding it off the track. Hang on to it, hang on to it. Mass hits Ike Durbin, and both of them are off the track. And, and Freya Mass definitely upset with the Hoosier after that uh, maneuver he pulled there. And I don't think that's going to earn uh, Mass too many fans among the stewards at the very least. Because, um, well, neither one of them looked particularly brilliant here. Let's just put it this. Let's just put it that way. Mass gates it a bit wide. Ike Durbin sends it in on the inside. We're having another look at it here. And Ike Durbin, yeah, Ike Durbin running the running a car off the track, especially over there, not exactly the brightest decision. But neither was this. Uh, Freya Mass throws it in there. Really doesn't look like she tries to slow down. But um, uh, takes Ike Durbin into the tire barriers. Uh, that'll probably earn both of them a, uh, let's say, a comfortable chair in the steward's office for a very long meeting. Needless to say, Cameron Taylor now in car number seven, uh, trying to extend his lead a bit over Joe Olenek. Uh, both these guys' former teammates, while they were deciding to waste their time at Peter Keyes' operation. Um, now that they're now that they're both uh, uh, opposite in. Uh, opposing teams at the front end of the field we can see what they well both of them can do and so far it turns out quite a bit because they're stretching away from Castaneda back in third uh, Cameron ta oh Taylor a bit slow Cameron Taylor a bit slow and he, that looks like that might be a puncture on the seven car yep that's what we're being told that is a puncture on car number seven as Castaneda goes by Kurt Pliskin held up Adrian Devereaux Liv Eklund going by Rossini going by as well and that's going to give Joe Olenek a massive lead over the rest of the field. Uh, Olenek in this 23 car. Uh, one thing that would really help him is uh, a win today, just to erase the pain of the San of the way that he lost San Antonio. Arto Kekin in the red number one car, and that is so official in the blue eight. David Krikorian, Scott Bates in the background. Kekin a bit wide. Uh, official really putting the pressure on the on the reigning champion. Kekin not looking like he's. Uh, Quite, uh, quite his usual self out there, but then again, uh, Arto Kekkonen did not start last year particularly fast either. Looking now at Dylan Buchanan in the 79 car, who's been running in co comfortably back at 37. And I think there's smoke coming out of that car. If I, no, I guess not. Well, there was smoke. I thought there was smoke out of somebody. I'll have to make sure to see what that was. Uh, Buchanan. Oh no, the no, maybe it was out of the 79. Uh, and that is an engine blow up. It looks like for Buchanan. And uh, that is going to be the end of the day for the Scott. Uh, what's been a very frustrating day for that team and a frustrating week for uh, Buchanan as a whole. Wish him better luck in his next attempt because that is a rough way to make your debut. Liv Eklund now setting up Adrian Devereaux what's for third. And uh, I didn't expect this out of Eklund, even though, even though out of all the road courses, this was on uh, the TM Light season last year. Oh, giving him a bumper! Liv Eklund taking it to the former three-time champion, and she takes him around the outside! Liv Eklund, that was before the bridge she set that up! Whoa! Now, Liv Eklund, keep in mind how far down Lynx's development line she was. This is not at all what I, what I was expecting out of Eklund this year, but she has been driving with the... She has been driving with the kind of fury that is going to lead her to not making too many friends in the paddock, and she's She's throwing a block on Devereaux. Devereaux, a crossover very late. And uh, Eklund not giving him a whole lot of room out there. Um, don't see any fists being shaken. Eklund off the track. Eh, I'm a little surprised. It's only the type of driving that gets under Adrian Devereaux's skin. 
as now they've both reeled in Castaneda in the nine car. Castaneda doing a pretty good job out there. Eklund throwing it in again on Devereaux on the outside. That's not going to work over there, though. Eklund off the road. Uh, the Frenchman now going to have an easy setup on Castaneda, who's giving him plenty of space uh, out there. Now, right here, that's how you make a pass through the S's, paging the drivers of a certain couple of three-digit numbered cars. Uh, as Eklund uh, beginning to fade away a little bit there, but um, uh, back into fourth position. But Eklund having a great start to the year, and this is still a great run for Castaneda so far. And uh, we're not at half distance yet. Scott Bates, car number six. Uh, I haven't talked about him a whole lot, but I want to talk about a guy whose road racing has gotten a lot better in the last few years. It's Scott Bates. That's why he won the championship a few years back. That's why he's won several races, and uh, the Oklahoma driver is still one of the more popular figures on the circuit. Rossini makes a move. That was a bit too late, and around goes the six. Oh, look out, look out. Woodard gets into Scott Bates in the 41. That's going to put Woodard out of it. Well, that's... Uh, not the, not the most brilliant move I've ever seen Rossini pull off. Let's uh, put it that way. See if we... Uh, no, we don't have another look at it. I don't think we really need one, to be honest. Arto Kekinen now trying to set up official to get that position back as Ingrid Hadeland falling... Oh! Oh, no! The engine's gone in the one car! So that's a blow-up for Kekinen in car number one. And uh, there is Ormond in car number 95 going by some cars with damage. We think that Ormond may have run over something. Well, it looks like he's okay right now. Kuznetsov wide in the 15 car. Kuznetsov way off the road in um, car 15. But Ormond at 28th having a pretty good day of his own. Uh, this is his last get. Oh, yep. Yeah, no, I guess he did run over something. Well, that's a lot of that's a lot of cars out from unrelated incidents in a short period of time. As Adrian Devereaux pits the 74 car. Uh, from second, Eklund staying out. Castaneda in, Pliskin in. Now we're gonna get a good look of uh, who, when everyone is pitting. Olenek in in car 23. Joe Olenek having a pretty easy day out there. Uh, looks a lot like his San Antonio performance. Just trying to disappear into the distance. Devereaux coming back out of the pits. That is D'Souza behind him. That is not for position. Uh, De oh, Devereaux slow a bit? Oh, D'Souza, nowhere to go, and maybe, oh, that wasn't, I don't know, I want another look at that. See if we can get another look at that, because Devereaux was very slow, and then um, D'Souza took his normal line, and I almost wonder if Devereaux didn't quite uh, give D'Souza enough room there. That is a, that's questionable. There we go, overhead view. Devereaux's definitely entering that, those, those turns a bit slow, and, well, to be honest, D'Souza was already off the track, but Devereaux was not uh, giving him proper space there. I don't real, I can't really say either one of them is in the wrong or in the right, for that matter. Um, I think I would be surprised if uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the stewards let that one go. Uh, and but I kind of wonder what was up with the 74 car. Now here is Castaneda running. Now the 61 of Woody Watts is on an alternate pit strategy. Just as a reminder. So that is technically for position, but Watts is going to be pitting in a couple of laps anyways. 16 of Kurt Pliskin uh, is right behind Castaneda now. Oh, close to being right behind him. And I think that's a really good sign for the PSI crew is Cameron Taylor's behind uh, Pliskin as well. And uh, Taylor also sort of on an alternate strategy as well. Uh, in Taylor and uh, Watts's case though, that is not by choice. This is Scott Bates very courteously moving over, giving everyone plenty of room to go by. In that car number six, the Oklahoma driver continuing to run out there uh, and not giving up, which is uh, sort of what we know Scott Bates for doing, never giving up. A uh, good way to live. As uh, uh, Cameron Taylor, car number seven, making a move on Pliskin. Pliskin not making Taylor's life that easy, and I don't think he has any interest in doing that because uh, Cameron Taylor could be getting in the way a bit if, uh, later on in the race if uh, Pliskin uh, gets by him right now and... Uh, don't think Pliskin wants to be backed up in Ingrid Hadeland, who looks a lot faster on the timesheet than in the previous stint. Here is running order on the left. Liv Eklund is still held on to second, by the way. Just a uh, little bit of update there. Uh, Lucas Grabert and Tim Ruiz are having a pretty good battle further down the field, as is uh, uh, cars 81 and 25. Hopefully we can get a uh, looks in on them. As here is a there's a there's a good visual of how long of a, how big of a lead Joe Olenek has right now. He is absolutely checking out right now. Uh, 
no one's really uh, close to him in pace right now, and that is a good sign for Olenek to have a very easy day out front. Cameron Taylor having a run on Pliskin now. Uh, Pliskin not giving him uh, giving him just a, just enough room, I think. As uh, Fischl drops a couple wheels off, Taylor takes over the place. Uh, now, if you're a Kurt Pliskin fan, I wouldn't worry too much. The 7 car is going to be pitting before he does, and uh, I don't think Cameron Taylor, on fuel alone, isn't going to be able to make it without having to pit one more time than the rest of the field. Bad time to have tire failure. Liv Eklund, by the way, is still running in second, and now we're beginning... Now uh, we're seeing that Eklund's times are really dropping, and that is very encouraging because, for Eklund anyway, because uh, she is uh, actually uh, might be the only car close enough close to running down Olenek. I don't think she's going to have enough time to get there, but if she's if she's uh, matching Olenek on lap time, we'll see what she does right here. And uh, pretty within a tenth of Olenek, so I think if Eklund can pick it up, uh, I think that'll be. Uh, that could be a pretty big day for Liv, and I think it already kind of is, to be honest with you. Who would have thought that she would be having this this good of a run this early in the year? Especially given the conditions, uh, circumstances in which she took that ride. As we're looking at Castaneda back in third. The, uh, oh, Castaneda drops two wheels off the road. He's been doing that a lot, and I'd be, I'd be pretty worried. Especially since it's rather consistently that he does that. Um... Car number nine, Joe Olenek on the lap car of Freya Mast. Mast giving, uh, I think he came on Mast a little quickly. Mast didn't check her mirrors, but um, Mast found a way to get out of the way. That'll cost Olenek a little bit on the stopwatch, but he has such a massive lead right now. Don't think he's got to worry too much. Truman Ellison is who we're looking at right now. The 50 car running back in 21st. This, this battle between him and the 32 of Chuck Johnson, South Carolina's Chuck Johnson, I should point out has been uh, heating up quite a bit, and look right behind them. That's the 90 car, that's Ben Atkins, as Ellison is off the road on the S's, hang on to it there. Oh, oh no, and Johnson gets into the back of Ellison, and off he goes. Well, I think, uh, I don't think Johnson's gonna need a penalty for that. I think that would be a bit, a bit much, but that's very unfortunate because Ellison was having a very good run out there. Here's Chris Davenport on Lucas Crabbert. Now, the German, Grabert, has is running in the points right now. He's running 19th. That's what this uh, battle is for. Davenport's going to get by him, but this is a great run by uh, Lucas Grabert because, uh, remember, Lawrence Gravity Racing is running very old, is running your old cars, and Davenport, yeah, Davenport really pulling away from him in the straights here, and you can tell that uh, that car is not doesn't have the same amount of horsepower that the Davenport's does. Now, here's one of the more heated battles on the track. Brandon LaRoe has absolutely been costing Craig Yonser a lot of time. There is some very interesting defending going on. Uh, Brandon LaRoe, remember, has somewhat of a very reasonable grudge against the Garbo Enterprises for firing him among some very questionable circumstances a few years ago, and he is giving Craig Yonser fits over it, and he is backing him up into the 68 car back there of John Dilks. Uh, so, uh, uh, Owen DeGarmo is... Uh, not terribly happy about this, especially since, uh, given LaRoe's history, but I think that is, uh, Yonser's not able to pass him. As we're looking at Timothy Ruiz, he's got Davenport coming right on by. Oh, Davenport with a hip check there. Timothy Ruiz has been having an excellent rookie campaign so far. You want to talk about unsung heroes in this rookie class. Tim Ruiz has been one of the midfield heroes so far. He's having an excellent start to the year, and, uh, there were, uh, he was being scouted by, uh, uh, Teams as early as 2012, from what I understand, and now I think I see why. Here's Davenport now going on, uh, trying to get around David Gregorian in the 13 car, who's having a bit of an off week uh, in that car. DK having uh, not having the best of weekends, but if a bad weekend for you is just around 18th or so. I'd say you're having you have a pretty good year ahead of you. Uh, Davenport gotten around DK, and uh, this is all the way from the back of the grid. So Chris Davenport having a very good run out there so far. Probably drive of the day so far, if, uh, if I'm going to be honest. Here is um, the cars 33 and 34, Ruiz and uh, Grabert. Now, as the tires start to wear in a little bit, this battle has heated up, and we're starting to see that again. Uh, Grabert in that black 34 car, Ruiz in the 33. Two, two guys that were a little bit unheralded when they... Uh, got their rides. When I say unheralded, I mean unheralded by the press, not necessarily by the paddock. Those are two very different things. As of what a move by Grabert, that's in very deep, 
and uh, Ruiz is going to be able to get by him. Right back past him, and Ruiz says, no, thank you. You're going to have to work. Uh, you're going to have to work a lot harder there, Eric Grabber, to take, to take this place. Uh, that's probably what he's saying in his head anyways. Uh, Cameron Taylor has boxed and pitted the five car, and uh, he's going to be well down the order. We're now on board with the car number 20. There's Gaspar de Souza, and who's that in front of him? That is Casey Lester, and uh, oh, Hunt. Oh, they get in contact, contact there. Oh, we've got a big crash there. Hunt and, oh, D'Souza right through the middle. It's like the Red Sea parted right for Gaspar D'Souza, and the Portuguese driver drove right through. Oh, that was a lucky avoidance there, but I'd rather be lucky than good. As you see the remains of Gareth Hunt's car. Uh, gonna drive it back to the pits and probably park that thing. Uh, he's almost certainly out of it. Bit of an ambitious move on Casey Lester there, though, let's be honest. As now looking at Ashby running up in ninth place, has been trying to run down Tony Durbin, who's running a fantastic eighth, but uh, really not much is. Oh, nope, we got another car on fire. Rather, uh, no fire scene, but another engine that's gone. Here is Luciano Savarol, who's worked his way up to 10th. Uh, Luciano Savarol, another good drive from the back of the grid. The Brazilian had an uh, awful effort in qualifying, didn't really give a. Um, uh, didn't really give an explanation as to why and we're now looking at the fastest car fastest lap of the day Just on the previous lap not that time by was set by this man Ryan Matthews a car that was booed in driver introductions has just run a 119 238 that is the fastest lap of the day by a couple of tenths and uh, Ryan Matthews really beginning to show what the uh, what that car is capable of and uh I think he's actually. I think he's almost thankful that um, uh, that his team was able to discover the broken shock mount after his uh, time was disallowed. Because not only does that mean he doesn't get a penalty, but that also means he doesn't have a, car, a part that it might break in the middle of the race. Embarrassingly, Ingrid Hadland in car number 19 has also really begun to pick up the pace a bit. Uh, looks like the, uh, they made an air pressure adjustment or something on the 19's first stop, and she is now really taken off. Uh, trying to hunt down her teammate, Liv Eklund, who we're now on board with right now. Now we're well, seeing on board. That is Joe Olenek way ahead of Eklund. Eklund has actually been faster than Olenek the last two laps, but not by very much. Um, she's going to run out of laps if uh, unless something happens. As Olenek enters, oh no! No, Olenek has gone off the course. He slid it wide. He's almost hit the tow truck, and Eklund now goes by. Eklund off the road as well. Liv Eklund, car number 11, has taken over the lead, and that, that is a gut punch to Olenek. One mistake, one mistake has erased the almost a 10 second lead on Liv Eklund. The super sub is now leading the race as Kurt Pliskin and several others are entering the pit lane for a scheduled pit stop. Eklund now in car 11 is uh, leading her first laps in a TM Master Cup Series race and uh, when uh, three months ago she wasn't scheduled to be in a Master Cup car at all except for a promoter's option in her home race. Well now, and given that she didn't have a TM Lights ride uh, necessarily sealed up either, means that uh, she is absolutely taking the world by storm here. And that is uh, the 78 car of Keegan Mallory has already pitted. So for any of the DH Racing Enterprises fans, and there are quite a few of them here, he's not necessarily in trouble as Eklund and Olenek both pitting at the same time. Eklund trying to cover Olenek. We'll see if the Lynx Racing crew is able to uh, maintain that gap. They are. They are. Liv Eklund's going to come out there as Cameron Taylor in the background. Liv Eklund's going to keep a hold on the lead. Oh, wow. And some of the rookie class really impressing here today. In all, not only at the front of the field, but in the midfield as well. Uh, so, even though we have a lot of superstars uh, in this rookie class, don't forget some of the drivers further back in the field as well. Looked like Eklund was a bit slow over there, don't you think? That was interesting. I don't know why that was the case, but she looked very slow coming down through the S's when she would be downshifting um, into around third and second gear. So we'll have to see if anything comes of that. These cars, five-speed transmissions in them. Ingrid Hadland, her teammate. Oh, Ingrid's off. Ingrid's off. Pliskin's going to get by. Now the Lynx crew had gotten Hadland out in front of Pliskin, but one mistake just erased that. Thankfully, Hadland was able to minimize that and has only, has only made that all losing one position as opposed to losing several. Because, as you can see, that very well could have been the case. David Krikorian has led a lap by staying out longer than any anyone else. And while that doesn't uh, count for points, it does count... Oh, Lennox in trouble. 
Joe Olenek in trouble. Is there a puncture on the 23? I think there is. This has gone from bad to worse for Olenek, who had full control of this race, and it wasn't even close. Olenek back into the pits, and that is a gut punch. Uh, in addition to the other gut punch he already received, as Ben Atkins has now worked his way into the points after starting at the back, and Chris Davenport in the 17 car, currently out of the points, had an awful pit stop in that 17 bunch. Um, but anyways, David Krikorian led that lap led. Doesn't give him a bonus point, but it does give the team a bonus money. And that is usually the, that is usually the incentive for doing that. But um, David Krikorian definitely doing what he needs to do for that team. As Cameron Taylor beginning to run down Eklund, that the 7 car is definitely faster than Eklund. And so is Castaneda, by the way. We, don't, we have just a handful of laps to go. A lot of lap cars ahead and not a lot of experience at the front of the field here. This should be interesting here. Eklund trying to run down Scott Bates now in car number six. But uh, uh, Cameron Taylor trying to uh, run her down first. And is Scott Bates going to give room? Uh, he probably is. Eklund has been swinging it a bit wide in this corner in particular. And uh, uh, Eklund looks a bit slow, maybe under acceleration. Cameron Taylor closing a bit. Eklund looks slow under acceleration over there. So now I'm almost wondering, was that... Was that actually a sign when we saw her slowing at the bottom of the S's that something was wrong? Here is Castaneda now beginning to reel her, to reel her in. Because Eklund, it wasn't a case of Scott Bates being in the way. That, the 11 just wasn't going under under acceleration down there. Cameron, oh, Castaneda way off course. He had thrown that thing in way too deep. Cameron Taylor sends it in on the inside. Is he going to lead this lap even though he's going to have to pin again? Eklund holds it and denies him. And Liv Eklund's definitely gotten the fire under her right now to uh to lead as much as she can preferably to the end of the race if you're Eklund but Cameron Taylor not able to do anything with her at the moment uh this was of course I mentioned one of Eklund's better showings of the TM Light series here but um this is this is on it this is an unexpected performance no question about it because Eklund's TM Light's record doesn't look as impressive as many of the other rookies coming up uh, she has a year of racing in an electric car, and uh, from what I understand, the amount of torque that the elect that the, the EGTs that she was running before uh, is actually quite similar to a Master Cup car on the uh, at the lower end of the power band. So that's a very interesting. Um, that was a very interesting bit that I picked that was able to pick up from uh, Eklund and from Lynx Racing uh, in when I was in their garage earlier in the week. Here is you know, Eklund now, who has caught Zach Webster in the 87. Okay, we're going to see what happens here. Eklund not, as, not swinging it as wide over on that rumble strip. Trying to get on the inside of the 87 as Castaneda has gotten around Cameron Taylor. I think Cameron Taylor may have waved him through. Because Taylor, no, I think, may know now that he's out of it. Because he's going to be buck. He's going to be bringing it into pit in a few laps. But Eklund not, being, not able to get by Webster. And uh, you could say that there are blue flag rules that may need to be um, abided by in this case, especially since Webster is not act actively racing anybody at the moment. Uh, but Eklund just not able to pull out and get past them, so that's another concern in and of itself. Eklund now off the final corner. No, still not uh, able to set up a move on the 87. Castaneda is now there. Eklund now going for it. Bit late to make that move there, but there we go. She's gotten around the 87. Castaneda trying to follow suit. There is Gaspar de Souza ahead of Webster, and uh, Castaneda able to get around the 87. And of note, I would like to point out uh, before anyone's critical of Webster for not letting the leader through, there were no blue flags waved for him. Interesting. Castaneda now trying to get by Eklund. Uh, coming in on the inside, Castaneda comes down through Eklund, holding it, and is holding it open as much as she can. Uh, not quite. Uh, Castaneda is able to get by, it looks like. And new leader, Marco Castaneda. Not much of a road racer, huh? He's made a pretty good run then. He's not only that, but we're going to talk about a guy whose car looked a little bit, even though he did lead the opening few laps, he dropped back very quickly. And um, looks like they made the right adjustments that nine car. Eklund throws it in. That could have been a big accident. But, um, and now she's trying again. The Swede is not, there is still a lot of fight in the Swede. But now, uh, Castaneda able to defend that. 
Eklund not fast enough off the final, uh, going through the final corner. Uh, but Castaneda has been able to make the right adjustments to that car. Rather, his team has. Uh, it would be a bit interesting if he grew about 10 extra arms and did all the adjustments himself, needless to say. Um, Cameron Taylor pitting the 7 car, uh, as expected. Adrian Devereaux now has caught Tony Durbin in a battle for 7th. Uh, uh, there have been other battles going on th uh, down through the field, and I apologize for not be, uh, being able to keep track of them as much as possible. But um, Devereaux in the 74 car, trying to make his way back to the field. And this is why you know, this is why he won three championships. His ability to come back from mishaps that happened to him earlier in the event. Tony Durbin giving him room. Uh, Tony Durbin's quietly been having a top 10 run all day, but I can't really say much has happened to him. Uh, this is Devereaux going by, uh, maybe squeezing Tony out a bit, but Devereaux goes right by. And um, as I said earlier, very patriotic paint job on that 74 car if you understand French culture very much. Here is cars 50 and 20 ahead of the leaders. Uh, no blue flags are going to be waved here because they are racing each other. And we're going to see if this holds up Castaneda in the last few laps here. Uh, let's see, Ellison going, no, it looks like they're holding a, they're holding station a bit. Oh, uh, nope, Ellison wide. Ellison wide, that's going to give plenty of room for the 9 and the 11 to go by. And uh, also Webster in the 87. Kurt Pliskin, by the way is holding third down quite well back there. He hasn't really been threatened much in the last few laps. So, uh, Marco Castaneda tracing down his first Kia Master Cup Series victory. Uh, he's got the Souza right there in the 20. Uh, and now we're looking back as, uh, look, now we're looking at Eklund now, trying to, uh, to catch Castaneda down. Eklund wide, almost into the sand over there. But she has lost a lot of momentum. And Webster has done get, now has a large chunk of momentum. He's going to send it on the inside of Eklund. And that's not going to go over that well, um, perhaps, with um, Eklund's crew. And I, I don't see blue flags away for the 87, even though uh, you could argue there should be. Uh, maybe not. Actually, you could argue right there. Now, if you're now if you're Zach Webster, you can argue there's no need to wave the blue flags. The 20 was off the track. Perspective's a funny thing, isn't it? Uh, Castaneda in car number nine, continuing to lead this race. Um, Webster trying to run him down, but as I said before, a while ago, there's not that many laps left, and uh, Castaneda continuing to stretch his lead a bit as Adrian Devereaux in car number 74 really pulled away from Tony Durbin here. And he hits the curb. Oh, bit sideways. And uh, he's pitting again. Puncture on the 74 car. Looked like Devereaux may have hit the curb and, and uh, felt something he didn't like. And uh, rather bring it in rather than crash the car. Probably going to drop him out of the points regardless. Eklund now having a run at the 87 car. And uh, I'm tempted to say this wouldn't really cost her the win anyways because Castaneda has um, really turned it up a bit in the, in the last few laps. I almost wonder if... Um, the 87 car's interference wouldn't really have mattered that much, as opposed to uh, a case where he had at the Maxwell Center. However, this could have an effect on who takes second place, maybe not on who wins, because Kurt Pliskin is coming, Eklund through the grass, Webster at it again. Now Webster's driving a Lenard and per previously drove for Power Circuit Incorporated, who runs the Lenard owned Lycoya brand. Ah, uh, huh, huh, that's funny. Pliskin now continuing. Pliskin now has a, a reeled in the 11 car, and um, we're gonna see if uh, and we're gonna see how well this battle uh, goes because uh, a Pliskin. Oh, that's Fischl at the back of that line, isn't it? So that's this could be the battle for second, third, and fourth heating up, along with the battle for some position well outside the points. Eklund almost sticking the bumper to Webster. Webster might have to let her go, and he's gonna have to here um, as Eklund swings it very wide and. Uh, no, Webster not seeding it. Webster still not seeding that to Eklund. As uh, Kurt Pliskin also now a participant in this battle. As a very active participant. Eklund going on by. Webster finally gives it up. And now he's got Fischl to deal with in the car number 8. Uh, it's also a Lenard car. Huh. But uh, he's Fischl also being boxed in at the moment. Let's see. Oh, now Webster moves over. Uh, no, official not close enough to make the move. In that eight car, official 
Uh, probably going to want to get by as quickly as possible, but he's also got to stop popping the curves if he's going to do that. Um, but uh, while all this is going on, Marco Diaz Castaneda has pulled out and disappeared from the rest of the field. Not much of a road racer, huh? How about not, how about not much of a surprise to see Marco Castaneda take his first TM Master Cup Series victory in front of the crowd here in Georgia. Castaneda wins on a road course. Not much of a road racer. No, I'm not going to let that one die. Eklund takes second, and if uh, there would have been a couple more laps, I don't think she would have been second. Pliskin had a very good charge late in the race, uh, with some assistance, I might add, by other cars. So official fourth. Ingrid Hadeland completes the top five. Uh, Liv Eklund, in uh, her post-race podium interview, did say that she was a little disappointed at the lack of blue flags for the 87 car, and that the other lapped cars didn't have those problems. Might sound a little tone deaf, but I can certainly understand her point, given that blue flags are supposed to be waved if you're not actively racing another car for position. She also confirmed something that I suspected was the case near the end of the race. She did not have third gear for the final 10 laps. Tony Durbin had a very quiet run all day, but still came home sixth. A pretty good improvement for him on the road courses, to be honest with you. Luciano Savaral in car number five came from 30th to 7th. Rossini, a great run to finish in 8th. David Krikori in ninth. Ian Cooper, they had a very good run out there. A uh, bit uh, sketchy towards the beginning of the race. I'm a little surprised the penalty wasn't thrown at them. That could happen post-race, but at the time of recording, that has not happened. Ben Ekins and Chris Davenport, from the last row to 11th and 12th. Um, now, Davenport, maybe a possible penalty handed to him, uh, given why that car was uh, too low after qualifying, but we'll have to wait and see. Craig Yonser, a solid 13th, and uh, this is well above expectations for him. Adrian Devereaux in 14th, and Brandon LaRoe just lost out to Craig Yonser uh, late, in the, late in the run after he went wide and uh, went into the grass a little bit. But Brandon LaRoe held on for 15th. Cameron Taylor, despite a puncture, camp, comes from 16th. An excellent run for Lucas Grabert. And you have Jenny Kuznetsov into points positions. Woody Watts, despite a puncture, 19th. And if Joe Olenek loses this championship by 59 points or less, then I think he is going to be absolutely kicking himself because he absolutely threw this race away, and this is going to hurt a lot if that happens, if uh, that ends up uh, playing itself out. That being said, let's have one look at the Drivers' Championship as it stands heading into Europe. The rookie official leads the way at 160 points. Tom Moore is still second despite crashing out early. Chris Davenport, what an improvement so far this year on 117. Castaneda in fourth. And this is a good improvement from the Michelin Suns. Adrian Devereaux in fifth. Uh, all four race winners so far in the top five. And Chris Davenport. Ryan Matthews and Ben Atkins, the two Matthews Motorsports cars, are exceeding expectations. So is Tony Durbin, to be honest. Luciano Savarol took a little bit of a hit after... Um, uh, this past couple of races, and Cameron Taylor rounds out the top 10 uh, because he, of course, has a tiebreaker with Rossini. Pliskin in 12th. Joe Lenick is way further down than I think he probably should be, uh, given how many points that team has kind of left on the table. Liv Eklund in the 11 is a lot higher, I think, than most people would have expected. Certainly surprising me so far. David Krikorian in the 13 is in 15th. Arto Kekkonen a little further down, I think, than you'd uh, expect for a reigning champion. Scott Bates has had some issues early on. So has Zelda Ashby. Both had problems today. Ingrid Hadeland, uh, only 19th, despite the fact that she's shown a lot of pace so far this season. It's not quite the results that are really gonna that are uh, perhaps expected, but we'll see. We've got some uh, races in Europe coming up, which is also where Yevgeny Kuznetsov has been the strongest in the past. Kuznetsov's last two podiums both came during the European Tour. Let's have a look at the Independence Trophy standings now that the first group of Independents has completed their four guaranteed runs. Unsurprisingly, Yokoyama leads the way with Freya Mast in second. However, uh, Mast has an interview with the stewards. That should be interesting. Orban's had a lot of misfortune, but remember, uh, an Independence Trophy contender can erase uh, what their worst result if they qualify for a special event or get a promoter's option, which is the reason why Keegan Mallory is on the board at all. The first special event on the calendar is the Crayola Grand Prix, but before then, the European Tour will kick off, and it will do so in France for the Round of France at Circuit Thierry Sicotte. If you'd like to watch some previous events in the series, check out this list over here, or check out this video from a friend of the show.